It must be admitted that however kind a person is will always be independent of how reasonable they are. Which is to say, it's possible for someone who is very polite and well behaved to make awful arguments. And it's just as possible for someone who is very rude and uncivil to make terrific arguments. But of course, we humans do not reason robotically. We do like to be listened to, to be appreciated, and to be rewarded. We do not like to be ignored, belittled, or intimidated. So let's take a look at the various ways in which you can build bridges between yourself and those whom you initially disagree with. So what are we doing now? I guess we talk. Let's imagine now that you are juror number eight. You've just established yourself as everyone's opponent, so you might think that the logical first step would be to start arguing right away. That would not be wise. Once you reveal yourself to be somebody's opponent, you would want to tread lightly. For one, you might not know where to build your first bridge yet. Since juror number eight doesn't know any of these men personally, he cannot presume to know which men will consider changing their mind and which men will fight him tooth and nail. Secondly, you ought to demonstrate that you have an open mind, which will almost certainly require that you concede to some of your opponent's arguments. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, you must establish goodwill with those whom you disagree with before before you start contesting their arguments. Goodwill is essential for building bridges. Without that, it will hardly matter how reasonable you are. And the last reason why you would want to tread lightly is because when somebody realizes that you're opposed to their point of view, their instinct will typically be to discourage you from expressing your point of view, especially if you're outnumbered. I just want to talk. Well, what's there to talk about? 11 men in here think he's guilty, you know, I think about it twice except you. So the best way to give yourself the best chance of building your first bridge would actually be to stall the inevitable first confrontation as long as you can. Notice how number eight manages this while talking to number seven. How come you vote not guilty? Well, there were 11 votes for guilty. It's not easy to raise my hand and send a boy off to die without talking about it first. Well, now who says it's easy? No one. That could have turned out much worse. Number seven was gently antagonizing number eight by asking this question. If number eight took the bait and replied with, apparently you do, he would have started an unnecessary confrontation. But by quickly replying with nobody, number seven was given no reason to pick a fight. Goodwill was established. Now there is an unfortunate reality when it comes to building bridges. You can only guarantee your half. Even if you do all of these things, you can only hope that you are eventually given support, which is exactly what number eight gambles for when he recognizes that he cannot maintain his side of the debate any longer by himself. I'm gonna call for another vote. I want you 11 men to vote by secret written ballot. There are 11 votes for Gilly. We'll take in a guilty verdict to the judge right now. But if anyone votes not guilty, we stay here and talk it out. This comes back to the necessity of goodwill. After having so many arguments, number eight recognizes that if he single-handedly keeps the jury in that room any longer, he will strain the remaining goodwill of the other jurors to the point where no one will want to listen to his arguments anymore. He needs an ally to continue the discussion. It may not be this simple for you to manage, but if you ever need an ally when your position is unpopular, you too will likely have to find your first ally confidentially. Not guilty. Boy, how do you like that? Oh, another chap flips his wings. All right. Who was it? Of course, you should also hope that whomever that first ally is will eventually come out in the open, just as juror number eight's first ally does. This gentleman has been standing alone against us. Now, he doesn't say the boy is not guilty. He just isn't sure. Well, it's not easy to stand alone against the ridicule of others. So he gambled for support, and I gave it to him. I respect his motives. But the boy in trial is probably guilty, but uh, I want to hear more. Right now, the vote is 10 to 2. I'm talking here. You have no right to leave this yeah, room. 
So this is the beginning of how the jury's verdict changes. One man is uncertain that the defendant is guilty, and another who is fairly certain that the defendant is guilty just wants to keep talking about it. But it's a start. Number eight has won his first ally. It was stated in a previous episode that juror number eight is the protagonist, whereas the antagonist is juror number three. What hasn't been stated is who their strongest allies are. For number eight, his strongest ally is his first ally. Number nine, the second man to vote not guilty. For number three, his strongest ally is his last ally. Number four, the second to last man to vote not guilty. And it also happens that both of these right-hand men are seated to the immediate left. But beyond that, there is very little in common between eight and nine's relationship and three and four's. Number eight and number nine have a mutual respect for one another. Both men are supportive of the other whenever an argument is being made, and whenever an argument isn't being made, they are still outwardly kind toward one another. Well, it's hot in here, isn't it, huh? Want a drink of water? No, no, thanks. Thanks. This mutual respect does not exist between number three and number four. Number four doesn't seem to care for number three all that much, only ever appearing to be slightly annoyed by him. And number three, upon noticing that number four is a smart and competent debater, often employs him to make an argument on his behalf. The kid is guilty. Why don't you listen to the facts? Tell him, will you? Aside from being just a bit pathetic, it is not respectful. You don't utilize your allies in a debate, you support them. The next juror to vote not guilty is number five. And why does he change his vote? Well, it's possible that he was convinced to by number eight and number nine's arguments, but he curiously doesn't announce this until after number 10 makes one of many insulting remarks about people from slums. Couple that with the fact that number three had previously and wrongly accused him of defecting in the secret ballot. You sit here, vote guilty like the rest of us, and some golden voice preacher starts tearing your poor heart out about some underprivileged kid just couldn't help becoming a murderer, and you change your vote. This serves as a fine lesson on how to burn a bridge. Sometimes people decide on their own to burn a bridge, but other times they feel encouraged to, due to the fact that they simply don't want to associate with those on their own side any longer. Didn't mean to get nasty. Glad you're not one of those less these emotional appeal influence them. Uh... You see, number five started off as an ally of number three, and he still was an ally when this happened. But after the treatment he received from number 10 and number three, it appears as though the reason why number five changed his vote was not just due to a reasonable doubt, but to spite the jurors who had previously spited him. Mr. Foreman. I'd like to change my vote to not guilty. You what? You heard me. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. The vote is nine to three in favor of guilty. The fourth juror to vote not guilty is number 11. He became skeptical that the boy would have gone back to the scene of the murder if he had really committed it. Number four challenges his reasoning admirably, but number three treats him like a traitor rather than addressing his reasoning. By contrast, number eight does the exact opposite. He voices his support for number 11's reasoning without addressing number 11 himself. Number three tried to intimidate one of his allies, whereas number eight was supportive of one of his opponents. This, along with feeling that his skepticism was warranted, results in number 11 changing his vote. Pardon? I vote uh, not guilty. Oh, what? Oh, 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 oh. To which number three chastises him. The vote is eight to four, favor of guilty. Hey, what is this? Love your underprivileged brother week or something? So far, the not guilty vote is still the unpopular position, and the men voting that way are still in the minority. But it's a strong enough alliance to contend with the other side. Notice how number eight's allies are willing to make the necessary counterarguments on his behalf. He would have had to walk 12 feet, walk 43 feet, all in 15 seconds. You think he could have done it? Sure, he could have done it. He can walk only very slowly. They had to help him into the witness you chair. You make it sound like a long walk. For an old man who had his talk, it is a long walk. Oh. And this minority only remains the minority until the next vote. After number eight raises doubt about the old man's testimony, two more men change their vote. Juror number two. 
Not guilty. And juror number six. Not guilty. The vote is now six to six. Once again, let's take a quick look at the ways in which the protagonist and the antagonist interacted with these two men before they changed their vote. Unsurprisingly, number three managed to offend both men. Starting with juror number two, number three had previously told him to shut up. What about the switch knife they found in the old man's chest? Uh, wait, wait a minute, there's some people who haven't talked yet. Shouldn't we go in order? They'll get a chance to talk. Be quiet a second, will you? Compare this to number eight, when he probably didn't want number two to talk either. He doesn't tell number two to shut up, he just lets him speak. The phrase was, I'm gonna kill you, the kid yelled it at the top of his lungs. Don't tell me you didn't mean it, anybody says a thing like that the way he said it, they mean it. Well, gee, now, I don't know. I remember I was arguing with a guy I worked next to at the bank a couple weeks ago. He called me an idiot, so I yelled at him. And then there's juror number six, another man whom number eight had treated with respect and another man whom number three had crossed when he spoke disrespectfully toward number nine. You keep coming in with these bright sayings. Why don't you send them into a paper? They pay three dollars a piece. What are you talking to him like that for? Guy talks like that to an old man really ought to get stepped on, you know? You ought to have more respect, mister. This is how you lose debates. It's not just by making less convincing arguments than your opponents, it's by failing to express goodwill toward your opponents. And it's a failure to express goodwill toward your own allies. Remember, number six was still voting guilty when this happened. Number nine was his opponent. But because of number three's behavior, someone on his own team turned against him to defend a member on the other team. You say stuff like that to him again, I'm gonna lay you out. So, the jury is evenly divided. By getting acquainted with each man, preventing unnecessary confrontations, expressing a fair share of uncertainty, and most importantly, establishing goodwill, Number 8's arguments successfully won half of the jury to his preferred verdict. Any juror who changes his vote at this point will join a majority, and that simple fact explains the next vote to change. After Number 8 challenges Number 4 to give a benefit of doubt to the boy's alibi, and after Number 5 challenges Number 3 to raise doubt about the boy stabbing his father, you would think that the next man to change his vote would do so because he was convinced by these arguments. Well, if you did, you would be wrong. I don't know about the rest of them, but I'm getting a little tired of this yakety yakking back and forth. It's getting us nowhere. So I guess I'll have to break it up. I changed my vote to not guilty. You what? You heard me. I had enough. What do you mean you've had enough? That's no answer. He's right. That's not an answer. What kind of a man are you? Juror number seven has just burned every one of his bridges and ruined any possibility of building any new ones all in one fell swoop. For changing his vote without conviction, he is ostracized by both sides. If you want to vote not guilty, then do it because you are convinced the man is not guilty and not because you've had enough. And if you think he is guilty, then vote that way. Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Why? I don't uh, think he's guilty. After this moment, the guilty party begins to unravel. Two more men change their vote, presumably for the right reasons, juror number 12 and juror number 1. All those voting guilty? Make your hands. One, two, three. Well, the vote's nine to three in favor of acquittal. And just after number seven ruined his reputation, destroying any and all goodwill that may have existed for him, number 10 proceeds to destroy what little goodwill he may have had left by launching into a bigoted tirade. The reaction is an invaluable life lesson. Nobody engages with number 10. With only a couple of exceptions, each man stands up, walks away, and literally turns their back on him. His bigotry is denied an audience, denied a single friend or an enemy. This kid on trial here, his, his type, well, well, don't you know about them? There's a, there's a danger here. These people are dangerous. They're wild. Listen to me. Listen to me. I have. Now sit down and don't open your mouth again. 
Within minutes, two of the strongest advocates for a guilty verdict, not to mention two of the loudest men in the room, period, effectively expel themselves from the debate. Given that there are only three men left voting guilty, and given that only two of them are still engaged in the discussion, what happens next? One of these three men is one of the most intelligent and reasonable among them all, juror number four, and he makes what appears to be a perfectly reasonable argument in favor of a guilty verdict. The fact that a woman living across the street from the accused testified that she saw the boy stab his father. She got a good look at the boy in the act of stabbing his father. As far as I can see it, this is unshakable testimony. Well, that's the whole case. But then comes one of the most pivotal exchanges between two of these jurors, and it takes place between the strongest ally of the antagonist and the protagonist, juror number four and juror number nine. Number nine calls the woman's testimony into question when he realizes that he noticed marks on the sides of her nose during the trial, and that those marks indicate that she, the only eyewitness to this murder, wears glasses. Glasses that she did not have on when she witnessed the murder. Once this has been established, number three takes over for number four, number eight takes over for number nine, and the two leaders of the two factions within this jury fight in one last battle. Maybe she honestly thought she saw the boy kill his father. I say she only saw a blur. How do you know what she saw? How does he know all that? How do you know what kind of glasses she wore? Maybe there were sunglasses. Maybe she was farsighted. What do you know about it? I only know the woman's eyesight is in question now. While number three still puts up a fight, number four is regretting his previous stance. This is a valuable reminder when you're trying to build a bridge with someone. If somebody who disagrees with you is intelligent and reasonable, it's never too late to present them with another argument. If they're anything like juror number four, they will concede to a reasonable argument. I'm convinced. Not guilty. What's the matter with you? I have a reasonable doubt now. 11 to 1. And so, number 10's reason for changing his vote appeared to stem from the shame he felt over his own prejudice that he displayed. Number 4 changed his vote due to his doubt about the eyesight of the woman across the street. This leaves the antagonist, number 3, by himself. He is the last man to vote not guilty, practically speaking, because he is unable to maintain his side of the debate by himself. In light of the fact that number three and number eight were arch rivals, who shared some of the ugliest exchanges in this film, it might be fascinating to see how these two men got along before they became the leaders of two opposing factions. When I was a kid, I used to call my father, sir. That's right, sir. You ever hear a kid call his father that anymore? Fathers don't seem to think it's important anymore. You got any kids? Three. I got one. 22 years old. Lo and behold, number three and number eight shared a moment of goodwill early in the film. Although it was ultimately in vain, it still sets a good example. Even if it is in vain, it is still worth trying to establish goodwill, because even if it's lost, you will at least be able to re-establish it once the debate is over. The way you build bridges in a debate is not by being really smart, very confident, or even necessarily persuasive. The way you build bridges is by exhibiting goodwill, even when you know what, especially when the debate has come to an end.